Hello and welcome to E4M Live from Cannes. I'm very happy to have with me today Jared Martin. He's the CEO at Kinesco. Now, Kinesco in India goes by the name Interactive Avenue. So we have lots to hear from him about how Kinesco is moving about in the India market and globally. Jared, welcome to E4M. Thank you for having me. Uh, Jared, I just want to step back to last year. Last year, IPG Media Brands merged Kineso, Reprise, and Mattermind into one performance marketing unit. This, uh, so how has this panned out? Yeah, it was a very big process. So there's about 6,200 employees that are involved in that merger um, in 2023. Uh, and so there's a lot of background work. There's different ways of working in different markets, and we had to align those. Um, but really it was overdue because what we're trying to do is simplify our operations and connect better um, our digital data and tech offering. Uh, historically, we were splintered by programmatic versus search and social, for example. And by combining those different groups together, we've been able to create a more seamless experience for our clients and more opportunities for growth for our employees. Uh, there was an initial period of um, where we had to kind of do a bit of background work to see how that would pan out and then get everyone accustomed to the new branding and identity. Um, but that process has been relatively smooth and now we're at the other side of it. I think we're a much stronger business as a result. So basically, IPG at a group level, you're looking to streamline your operations, right? Yeah, we're looking to remove complexity uh, where it's possible and to improve the client experience by greater simplicity and easier access to a broader range of services. Um, now, Kinesso is positioned as a tech-driven advanced technology company and at the same time because of the IPG background you also bring in the agency perspective so how does this help how does these two help uh, the clients help drive results for the clients yeah so um, I'll talk about the Kinesso piece to start with what we're trying to achieve is to um, simplify the data and tech world I think a lot of our competitors might try to overcomplicate things sometimes and, and we really want to be able to talk in a language that clients can understand and give them solutions that are really meaningful and drive impact for them. Um, as it relates to the broader media brands and IPG network, Kineso plays kind of two roles. The first one is a client-facing brand where we're looking to bring on performance-based clients and clients that are really strong in that data and tech space. But then the second and more important role is an ingredient brand that helps to power the rest of IPG to provide it with the performance data and tech muscle to help clients achieve better business results against the campaigns they run. So what is the value that uh, Kineso then brings to the entire IPG group and how do, how do you differentiate yourself? Our job is really to bring data and technology at scale to the entire group. So creating technology that powers uh, strategy, media planning, media buying, measurement and optimization. So those kinds of technologies are in the hands of all of our user base. And the idea is we better connect those over time and we give more users access and improve uh, the connectivity between those different modules over time. Um, so we're really the, the wind beneath the wings of the agencies of IPG, using technology to give them access to data at scale, reducing the amount of manual effort that's required to perform repetitive tasks, and giving them better access to better data to make better business decisions. You just mentioned scale, but scalability and the other part would be addressability is a challenge. So how do you go about that? Yeah, I mean, the biggest barrier in my mind to scalability of technology isn't technology itself, it's process and adherence to process. When we have uh, people all around the world that might do things differently, it's really hard to create a single platform that's adopted universally. And so we embarked on a process a couple of years ago to help to streamline and simplify our processes. And by doing so, that's enabled us to adopt technology at far greater scale than we ever have before. So we've got a significant proportion of our user base, our global footprint now, is using one part of our overall platform or more parts of that overall platform. The other thing we've done is try to align the consoles that we have within our overall technology platform to the different types of users that exist within our company. So a strategist will have a console that's built just for them. A planner will have a console that's built just for them. And by doing that, it simplifies their user experience, reduces friction, and allows us to have a clean user community to get feedback from to help improve our products over time. The other important aspect is data privacy, especially since we have all now moved to first-party data. So uh, is that a concern now, or is it something which you think will not be so much of a concern? 
Uh, data privacy will always be a concern, and I would look at data privacy from a couple of angles. Um, there are situations where we might uh, manage first-party data on behalf of our clients, and we use Axiom as our one-stop shop for that because Axiom has a pristine reputation for managing first-party data. They work with nine out of the ten biggest banks in the world, for example, and manage their data on a daily basis. So the rest of IPG does not touch first-party data outside of the Axiom group. Uh, then I'd look at it from a client lens. So clients have sensitive data that they might want to protect and might not want to let out into the wider ecosystem. And our policy is that we try to honor our client commitments and make sure that we create data environments that might be unique for those clients and aren't connected to any other data environments. And we try to create things like secure si single sign-on so that we've got um, uh, uh, double authentication to ensure that we don't get data leakage, those kinds of things happening. But we look at it from the consumer lens using Axiom as our privacy gateway and then from a client lens using different technologies to ensure that data leakage does not occur for client data. Uh, now, you have mentioned that uh, Kineso is, uh, you know, stands on four key pillars. If you yep. could elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, when we think about, um, and the, the pillars are actually increasing over time. So when we think about the different types of users that exist within our business, you have strategists and their job is to try and come up with cultural insights and strategic insights and to help identify high value audiences. So that's one kind of platform that we're, that's part of the overall um, technology solution. The second group is media planners, and they're looking to understand how do we allocate money to channels and to partners based on the effectiveness, reach, consideration, purchase intent, conversion that relates to those partners and channels. That's the second group. The third group is people who run campaigns. So how do we effectively push that strategic plan into a tactical plan and execute that over time? And then we've got people who are doing analytics to try to understand what performance looks like. And we have a console that relates to that kind of behavior as well and those kinds of consumers. Now, I just also wanted to ask you about AI. Currently, how much are you seeing what percentage of your clientele is actually using them, uh, you know, for any of their marketing efforts? Or, and how much do you see this increasing, say, two years or three or five years down the line? Is it just going to be, is vanilla advertising going to be a thing of the past? Uh, I think, well, I'd, I'd talk about AI in a few different contexts. So there's AI that we use in our services that we provide to clients. And most of the AI that we produce is actually uh, a powering mechanism for our clients. Now, clients don't necessarily see the AI that we leverage. So, for example, we might leverage AI to help come up with uh, reports or PowerPoint Data. decks and those kinds of things. And the client just sees the end product. Right. And obviously, a human being will vet that product to make sure that it's accurate and reliable, uh, but AI gets us, let's say, 60% of the way there to producing those kinds of outputs. Then there's how clients might use AI themselves. And we're seeing massively varying levels of take up of AI on the client side. Uh, certain clients just say have got very uh, sophisticated websites with, with hundreds of thousands of pages uh, might use AI quite extensively to help come up with product description pages, for example. Clients that have a relatively simple infrastructure they're just starting out on the AI journey and they're kind of experimenting with things, but they haven't necessarily figured out a way to scale it and to productionize how AI works for their business. So basically, AI right now works on the background when it comes to insights, but there are still, we're trying to figure out how it works at the front end, if I may yes. just to put it simply. Yeah, I would say that, that AI as an ingredient into a managed service, I think we've got a good handle on as, as the holding company landscape. But AI as a self-service to clients directly is something that we're still trying to figure out how that's going to work moving forward. Now, coming to APAC, how you're looking to build a stronger footprint in APAC, I believe. So how is that going on? Yeah, so I'd look at that in a couple of contexts. So the first one I'd say is that we've built a global capability center network uh, where we have hubs that provide essential services like analytics like media buying, like billing and reconciliation services, HR, finance services. And those hub markets are service markets all around the world. And India is our single biggest hub market that services other markets around the world. And we've got an office in Mumbai that's really important for that. And we're launching a new market in uh, Pune in July of this year. That's going to be a big office that's all centered around powering the rest of IPG. The second one is like, what's the strategic importance of those markets in and of their own right. So we're trying to service clients in APAC and India 
is a really key market for us. It's a very strong market for us. It's one of our top 10 markets. Um, outside of India, we're looking to invest in areas like China or Japan to improve our offering in those locations. I'm going to say APAC is a very vast market, you know, geographically, culturally, language-wise, sophistication-wise, cost-wise. So it's a, it can be a difficult market to manage, a difficult region to manage. But I think we're improving greatly, uh, and we really want to take strides and make APAC a really good priority for us moving forward. How do you see things in India panning out going ahead? You mentioned that it's an important market for you, but how do you see things evolving for you in India? Uh, I would love for us to have, in a couple of years' time, for India to be the powerhouse for IPG globally, not just for media, but for all of IPG, where India helps us to power up anything from uh, media services to creative to production to um, CRM and it to be the backbone of our global network. That's where I think we can get to over time. It's going to take a few years, but I can see the roadmap there, and, and we'll take steps on a gradual basis to get there. Finally, if uh, you may say, what's been the growth that you've seen last year? And looking at India, what have you any target? Is what, uh, what growth do you expect or anticipate to see? Yeah, I mean, APAC as a region uh, is up and down in its growth rate. India for us has always been really strong and it continues to be strong this year and we expect it to be even stronger next year. Um, I would say uh, India outperforms our global average and it definitely outperforms the rest of APAC. So we expect to see really strong growth into India in 2025. Thank you so much for your time. It was really lovely talking to you. You too. Thank you.